going to go over exercise 16 and what you need to do to complete this exercise. So for exercise 16, you have this sheet that you can type your answers into or you can create your own Word document. If you create your own, it doesn't need to be this formal. Just list one, two, three, and put your answers to the questions. So the first question here is, what do degrees of freedom mean? And then it says that this study did not provide the degrees of freedom. Why is it important to know the degrees of freedom for a T ratio? And then it wants you to use the degrees of formula, degrees of freedom formula to calculate the degrees of freedom for this study. So let's start with the first part of that. Now you can find in the text or in lecture slides what the degrees of freedom are. Basically, it's a way of approximating the sample size. And there's a more complicated explanation than that, but that's basically what it's doing is approximating how large our sample was, so how good our estimate might be. Because the larger sample we have, the better estimate of the population parameter we, we have. So the second part says they did not provide the degrees of freedom. Why is it important to know the degrees of freedom for a t-ratio? So we talked about in class how when you have a z-score, you can use the z when your sample size is over 30, and the z-scores don't change. Once you have over 30 participants, it's going to be assumed to be an approximately normal distribution. So the z-score value is not going to change. But the t tables, or the t score, that takes into account your sample size. So the t value is going to change based on your sample size. So knowing that, why do you think it would be important for them to report what the degrees of freedom was? OK, so remember that the t value is going to change based on this degrees of freedom. So why might we want to know what that is in the um, results of their reporting? The last part of this is says to use the degrees of freedom to calc or formula to calculate the degrees of freedom for this study. So we have different ways to calculate degrees of freedom for our different tests. And you can look through the book or you can look through the lecture slides to see the degrees of freedom for t-tests. I have a little shortcut for you here. I have the degrees of freedom formulas for t-tests. So with a t-test, when we have independent samples, our formula for degrees of freedom is going to be the sample size of group 1 minus 1 plus the sample size of group 2 minus 1. We take these into account separately because these groups don't need to be equal sizes. So here n equals sample size. For a dependent sample, we figure out our degrees of freedom by taking n minus 1. And here n is equal to our number of pairs. Remember with a dependent sample, we're going to have an observation in the second sample that matches every observation in the first sample. So this is called paired data sometimes. So we take the number of pairs that we have and subtract that from one for dependent samples. So you'll need to figure out if you think this is an independent or dependent sample t-test and use the proper formula to calculate the degrees of freedom. Number two is a multi-part question, so I'm going to start with the first part. What are the means and standard deviations for age in the buzzy intervention and control groups? So you need to look back through the text and find what they reported the mean age was for the intervention group and control group, and also the standard deviation for age for the intervention and control group. And write those here. What statistical analysis is conducted? to determine the difference in means for age for the two groups. So when we're looking for differences between two groups, we're typically going to use a t-test. This could be for either independent or dependent samples. So look through the text and see if they report it or what you think it was. Um, was this an appropriate analysis technique? Provide a rationale for your answer. So don't just say yes or no here. They're trying to look for the differences between the two groups, the technique that they use to do that, the specific test. Do you think that was an appropriate way to do it? And just give some explanation for why you think it was appropriate, just a sentence or so. Number three, what are the t value and p value for age? And what do these results mean? 
So look through the text and find what they report that T test statistic was, or the T value, and also what they report the P value to be for H. So then interpret those. What is the T test telling us, that T statistic? That's telling us about the difference between the two groups, right? So what's that telling us here? And then the p-value is one of the methods we use to determine significance. So interpret that finding, and do you think it was significant? Number four, what are the assumptions for conducting the independent samples t-test? So the we have assumptions that are listed in the textbook and in the lecture slides. So look through and find what those are and just list those assumptions here. Number five, are the groups in this study independent or dependent? Provide a rationale. So you need to look and see if you think that these are independent or dependent samples. Independent samples, each participant would not have any relationship to a participant in another group. So you would take a larger group of people and randomly assign them to one of two groups. A dependent sample would be either the same people at multiple time points, like a pre and post test, or people that are literally related to each other. So which do you think this um, study used? Was it independent or dependent? Number six, what is a null hypothesis for procedural self-reported pain measured with the Wong-Baker faces scale for the two groups? So the null hypothesis we talked about in class is always going to be that there's no difference between the two groups. And then we go through the steps of hypothesis testing. We run our results, we get our answer, and then we either are going to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. They say accepted here. I like the term fail to reject a little better. If you put accepted, I'm not gonna mark you off though. So our null hypothesis was there's no difference between the two groups. After running our analysis, are we going to reject that null hypothesis? And we would compare the p-value that we got as our result to the significance level that we set. Review the slides on significance and on um, hypothesis testing if you're struggling with this question. You're going to compare the p-value to the significance level. If the p-value that you calculated is lower than the level of significance, then you're going to reject the null hypothesis. Seven, should a Bonferroni procedure be conducted in this study? So a Bonferroni procedure is a kind of complicated, well, it's just a little bit more advanced, not necessarily complicated, statistical technique to correct for the fact that we've run multiple tests. Every time we run a test, we have possible outcomes, we could be making a correct decision or we could be making an incorrect decision. And so the more tests we run, the more chance we have of making an incorrect decision just because of a random finding rather than an actual effect. So a Bonferroni procedure corrects for the fact that we ran multiple tests. So knowing that, look at the study and what they did. Do you think they should have corrected for the fact that they ran multiple t-tests? A why or why not? Number eight, what variable has a result of t equals negative 6.135 and p equals uh, 0.000? So you need to look back through the text in the table and find the t or the result that has t value or t statistic equal to this and p value equal to 0 0.000. And then interpret those. What is the t value telling you? And what is the p-value telling you? This is a low p-value. Compare this to your level of significance that was set. Would this be a significant result? So that's what we're looking for here. In your opinion, is it an expected or unexpected finding that both t-values on table two were significant? So you need to look at what they were reporting there and just kind of conceptually do you think that you would expect to find both of those to be significant or not? Number 10, describe one potential clinical benefit for pediatric patients to receive the buzzy intervention. So this is using your clinical knowledge that you have or do some research online. And what's a clinical benefit to this intervention? If you pull in an outside resource, make sure that you cite that properly. So this is just your opinion here. What do you think? And that's what we need to do to complete this assignment. 
Remember when you save the file to save it as a new file with your last name in the file name. 